Доброе утро, Москва. So, good morning, Moscow. Hello, hello to Melbourne, uh, to Australia, and to other all parts of the world. Here we are in Moscow at Laboratoria Art and Science in Tretiakov Gallery. And we are happy today to start our online lecture and discussion with our friends and uh, artists. Uh, some of them I know for very long. Uh, John McCormack is an artist and a director and the founder of a Sensi Lab, a unique institution in the world, a center with a truly interdisciplinary center uh, based in Melbourne, in Monash University. And uh, hello, John, he's in Melbourne, so. Uh, Hi, Daria, good morning. Yeah, uh, good morning and good evening to you. And good evening here, Reiches, yes. Uh, and Nina Rajic, uh, she's a, also, also Australian artist and researcher uh, in Sensi Lab, and she has a background in physics, she will tell us later. And we are so happy that we are presenting her work, uh, a new work, uh, Mirror Ritual, in our exhibition, which actually I'm sitting now in the exhibition view, and sitting here not just for decoration, I want to give you a small overview of what's happening here. And today our plan is that uh, John will tell us about his projects and his maybe colleagues projects and the Sensi Lab, what they are doing. And uh, I'm really happy to hear news because this is, uh, I'm really admiring and wishing to come to Sensi Lab for so many years. I hope it will happen one day and uh, Nina will tell us in more details of this intriguing work that we have on show, Mirror Ritual. So uh, I would like to give a small introduction of the exhibition. Uh, I know that many visitors already been here, many people already know what the show is going on, but for some who don't know or who is not in Moscow, uh, I'm giving, uh, okay, let's say two minutes, uh, not to take time from our speakers today, I'll give you a small show. So for those who don't know, this is our new space. So our permanent space in New Tretiakov Gallery, Laboratoria Foundation. And the show is what we opened called May the Other Live in Me. It's about interspecies communication. Uh, the first work, Yelena Nikanoli, it's a dialogue with the birds and understanding what birds are telling to us with the help of AI and ornithologists, a collaboration between them. Um, in the exhibition, there are three sections and we are talking uh, with plants, uh, with uh, uh, animals, other creatures, uh, bacteria, viruses, and also machines, of course. And here is a work by Orphan Drift Archive, and it's about, it's called If AI Were a Cephalopod. So the title talks to itself. Then we go to this uh, massive installation by uh, Slovenia, Slovenian artist Sasha Spachal Earthling. And it's about uh, symbiosis of all in the planet and the breeze of all planets that all is connected. So one of uh, favorite parts of this installation for our visitors, here is Mycobacterium vaca, and visitors can breathe through the masks. Of course, during the pandemic, uh, so we have some limitations, but um, yeah, all special needs are, uh, yeah, we, we do all what we can. And this is also one of the headlines of the exhibition. It's a one tree ID, you, you see a real, uh, a real tree which has this perfume and it's unique uh, unique ID so trees are talking to each other not only through the uh, roots uh, but through this chemical biochemical interaction and uh, artists with the uh, with the help of uh, uh, chemists and uh, professional perfumers. Uh, they, she uh, made this special perfume that visitors can put on ourselves, on us, and to become a tree to another tree. Uh, here, 
we have a mirror ritual about what uh, uh, Nina will tell us a lot later. Uh, I said, please hold a computer that I can see. So this is a fantastic mirror, which is talking to us to, to its, uh, you should feel cheerful about the choice you have made today. So this is the poetic statement, uh, which is a neural network is generated for my, for my emotions, for my face today. And this is the work about from Nina Reichich. She will tell us today later. Um, some other works. I promise that I'm talking only two minutes, I think a little bit more, but this is uh, also important work. I can't not mention it. It's one of the highest points of a symbiosis at the exhibition. It's a work by Arthur Yenta Abje, a French, uh, French uh, duet. And so this is a maximum of how we can interact with other species, with animals. So the artist took an injection of a, a blood horse, of a horse of the blood, and made this a radical bioart performance. So the work uh, by Jana Sutella, it's a bacteria and she tries to read this language of a bacteria uh, with the help of neural networks. And uh, so it's a long story about this work and it's audio visual work. And so the bacteria, this special bacteria can live on the Mars surface and she's studying it. So we have one special hall where we talk about observation. And this is a machine uh, called Mirage by Ralph Becker, a uh, German artist. And this is a dreaming machine, a machine which is dreaming about magnetic fields. So we never see it, but the machine can, can give us a clue how it can look. And this is a Russian artist. This is Ftol, Dmitry Morozov, and it's robot which has a crystal inside. And this robot is investigating its own body. I think I, I told you almost about all installations. Also here is a uh, documentation of a performance, Marina Abramovich, and the study of a brain synchronization via nonverbal communication. Uh, yeah, this is a scientific piece and it's also uh, the only one piece where we have communication human to human. And one more piece is it was a special production with us and Kaspersky Lab. This is a work by Dania Vasiliev and it's about digital traces. We permanently, we every day we live in the space. And this is interactive piece. Uh, we need to, to go into this palantir, uh, go inside and probably leave our biometrics uh, and in, go to other digital world suite. So this is introduction for all who wanted to know what's happening here. And I'm so happy now to give a word to John and to know how is there in, in our uh, <laughs> brother's institution, also lab, the Sensi lab, how it's going there and what's new and in these really strange times, uh, the pandemic times, what's going there? And we are really would be so happy to know more about your research and all what you want to tell us today, John. Give you word. Okay, yes, thank, thank you, Daria. And um, thank you so much for the opportunity to talk. Um, today and congratulations on a fantastic exhibition. Um, I wish we could be there, but unfortunately we can't travel at the moment. So we have to be here virtually. Um, shall I share my screen? I think I'll do that as I have a presentation. Um, and okay. So yes, as Daria mentioned, um, I'm from Sensi Lab at Monash University in Melbourne in Australia. And I'm just gonna spend um, a few minutes just talking about our lab and the projects that we do. Um, 
particularly the research projects that we do, which are very much in the spirit of art and science working together. So uh, we have a little statement about who we are and what we do. And we're basically a creative technology space in physically based in Melbourne, but virtually we work with collaborators all over the world. And our mission is really to look at the untapped potential of technology and how it impacts society and the possibilities it presents. And we have a very unique and exciting research space in which we work, which I'll show you a little bit of um, in a minute. So all our work is really driven by some very simple principles that we love to make things. So rather than just theorize about things, we like theory, we love philosophy, but we also love to make and build things to put our ideas into practice. And that in order to do that, we don't look at a single discipline alone. We like to work across many different disciplines and we respect the idea of diversity of skills and different perspectives when it comes to the work that we do. And that also we encourage collaboration between different disciplines. So for example, scientific disciplines, uh, technical disciplines and creative disciplines as well. So part of the way that our lab works is that we don't um, just work on one particular topic or one particular thing. We have people working across all aspects of science and technology, and we really just provide a space to facilitate that. So I'm going to talk very quickly about some of the projects um, that we've worked on. And of course, you'll hear from Nina after me, and she'll talk more specifically about her own work. So this is the space uh, where we work. Uh, it was completed in 2018. So we've been there for three or four years now. Um, it consists of a series of studios that focus on each of the senses. So sound, sight, um, kinesthetics, and so on. Plus it has a very large um, set of spaces for visualization, for interaction, um, for sound uh, production, sound recording, and working with sound. And also a very large maker space. This isn't actually in the lab. This is a alternate maker space we had in uh, Shenzhen, but uh, the, our maker space is more or less the same thing. And that basically is just a big collaborative area where people work with things like electronics, uh, with 3D printing, with digital fabrication and so on. So we have um, four broad themes that we um, frame our research under. I won't bother going into a lot of detail, but I'll just show you examples and they should become clear. Uh, one stream looks at the kind of future possibilities for media in general. Another big area is what we call creative AI and, and you know, some of the work that you'll see um, is an example of that. We're also really interested in the idea of intelligent spaces, sensory spaces that don't just privilege the visual sense, but privilege or that, that incorporate other senses as well. And lastly, um, embedding computation into matter itself and where a possible future where computation is embedded in almost everything. So I'm just going to talk quickly about projects. These are not all my projects. These are really the people, the fantastic and talented people that I work with. And many of these are working on their PhDs or finish their PhDs. Um, so one of the areas that we're really interested in is the use of virtual reality. And I'd just like to talk quickly about the work of a former student, Sojong Bang, who's um, finished her PhD last year. She was really interested in the idea of um, making virtual reality uh, move beyond the cliche of it being an empathy machine. So putting you in a virtual situation where the sense of empathy was very strong. I think she reacted quite strongly against that idea and wanted to see virtual reality in terms of the flaws that it has, as well as the advantages that it has in terms of things like immersion, um, being able to sort of effectively be in someone else's shoes to be someone else and so on. So she made a series of virtual reality works. This is the first one. Um, it's called Floating Walk. And it was done using a very inexpensive 360 um, degree video camera. And it basically plots her own personal path, her own journey as a South Korean artist coming to Australia to work in Australia and the difficult issues that that raised for her. Um, so it's a very personal work. It's it's incredibly immersive um, um, and it's also quite touching, but also 
there's a kind of social distance that you maintain from it. And she incorporates scenes from her family life along with um, aspects of the, the city walk, which is uh, very much inspired by uh, artists like Walter Benjamin. Um, so, of course, we, we, we present these works and uh, people get to experience them regularly in our lab. That's just part of what we do. Um, this, another work that she worked on was called Sleeping Eyes. She worked with a, an artist who suffered from narcolepsy, which is basically where you fall asleep uncontrollably. And the kind of social and cultural issues surrounding narcolepsy and how people might experience that through virtual reality. So she created this very surreal world that um, is representative of the life of this person suffering from narcolepsy in a, in a very um, unique and um, confronting kind of way. So all of the characters in the film are kind of human but not human. There's a play with embodiment and disembodiment and so on. Um, I'll just very quickly show you. I feel like I am in the two places at once. Kind of like a superposition of quantum mechanical states. I am both awake and asleep. Here and not here at the same time. Except when I think about myself, or somebody is watching over me. Um, and of course, due to the current pandemic situation, um, it's very difficult to exhibit works like this and to share headsets. So I just um, I highlight the, um, the fact that Sojong actually had to have an exhibition of her work done virtually. Um, uh, so basically a virtual exhibition in a web browser about virtual reality, which is um, really interesting. And I'd encourage everyone to um, uh, have a look at that. You can access it from our website. So another, um, another work that I wanted to talk about was something of my own. And again, this is very different, but in a way related. Uh, so my art practice has largely been concerned with the relationship between people and the natural world and growing up in Australia and being in an environment that is um, one of the, you know, one of the very uh, last remaining areas of pristine um, bushland uh, in, in um, a very much an increasing world that is urbanized. Um, my artwork is really inspired by that. So this work was a commission for a railway station um, in Sydney, in Australia. Uh, it's a whole series of virtual plants that are basically evolved using the computational equivalent of, of evolution and, and DNA. So I create the DNA of these plants, evolve them, and then use the computer to, to render images of them. In this particular work, the plants are all local species from the Sydney area that used to exist before the station existed. And it's um, displayed on this very large screen that you can see at a mezzanine level in the station. And uh, you see these plant species that continuously disintegrate and break into their constituent components, which in this case is um, individual triangles or polygons that the computer uses to represent them. Just have a quick video here to show. Um, so this just shows you the, the view um, as you come from the station um, into the mezzanine. There's this very large 25 meter screen that's constantly playing this animation um, uh, that you just get glimpses of. So you're really just seeing the um, flora of Sydney as it used to be disintegrating literally in front of your eyes. So the station gets about um, 
I think 60 to 70,000 people normally during the day, although at the moment Sydney is, is in lockdown because of COVID, so there's nobody in, in the station. Um, and the work is silent. There's no, there's no sound that goes with it. But uh, the reaction that a lot of people have is um, uh, kind of a sense of disbelief that there's this computerized version of of local flora that people might recognize that's constantly disintegrating. And it's indeed, it's a kind of a reflection on climate change and our relationship with the environment and how we experience it now through digital mediation rather than literally. Some of the other projects that we work on um, are very much in the space of wearables. And um, this is a project, a, an experimental project we did to look at the idea of touch at a distance. So um, a customized haptic device that someone could wear that it would allow other people to send them touch messages through vibrations on their arm. And the interesting thing about this project was that the um, that strangers could send you touches as well. So it raises all sorts of interesting questions about mediated touch through social networks and so on. Um, and the idea of a stranger touching you who you don't know as well. Of course, they're not literally touching you, they're touching you through the mediation of an electronic device. And one of the, the great things that we have in our lab is the ability to custom design electronics um, and to make um, quite complicated computer-based sensors and wearable devices and so on. I just highlight a couple of those. So these are not really art projects. These are more practically oriented. This is a project that is designed to give you better sleep health. So we work with a medical researcher who's interested in the melanopic function of the eye. That is the part of your eye that senses light that you don't actually use for vision, but it's used to control the circadian rhythms um, of, your, of your sleep and your waking life. So we've developed a sensor that you can see on the right here that you wear that measures your exposure to specific wavelengths of light and also designed a lamp that has the right frequencies of light depending on the time of day. So this idea is that this sits next to your bed and when you go to bed at night, the light is the right color and it also serves to charge your phone and to charge the device. So this is a prototype of the device we're developing at the moment. Another project that we have uh, looks at um, helping people who suffer from diabetes. So building a sensor that fits in a shoe that allows you to measure the pressure and temperature variation over time and using machine learning to try and understand if there's a change in the way that you're walking, if that might be impacting on your health. Um, these are just a series of prototypes that we've been working on and we're partnering with a, a shoe company to actually um, turn this into a product. This project is completely different. Um, it's a musical instrument. It's a new kind of musical instrument, but the technology that it uses is actually derived from the previous shoe project. So we've developed these custom electronic boards that measure very accurately the position and orientation of, of something. And um, uh, basically we have a researcher who's a musician, Alon Ilzar, who works with this and he's attached them to a pair of drumsticks. Um, we also have a, a whole um, group of people who are working on this project to turn this basic gestural information into a meaningful language musically. So one of the metaphors we work with is the idea of energy. So by moving the stick around, um, you generate energy in a particular area and that energy can be transferred to musical information. Now that might sound um, quite unusual and a little bit hard to grasp, but I think if I show you the next video, you'll see what I mean. So this is Alon performing with the instrument. So you can see it's completely wireless and um, the sensitivity is, is really responsive musically um, to how he's moving the instrument around. Another project um, that we're involved with is, again, this is very different, but um, a really beautiful project of working with um, an architect, uh, Natalie Alimna, who's um, trained in architecture, but is very interested in biology. And so we've been working together to look at the hybridization of um, 
computational technology, robotics, and biology. Um, so we recently uh, published a, a book chapter on this, looking at the kind of future of hybridization between organisms and machines. Um, and I'll just talk a little bit about some of the ideas that we've been exploring. So one of them is to look at insects as programmable 3D printers. So if you look at um, organisms like this wasp, it's actually a very good um, um, architect, if you like, or engineer, able to design quite uh, geometric and rigid structures that uh, withstand weather and all sorts of other predators and so on. Um, so we're interested in the way that organisms, particularly insects, can be reprogrammed uh, to create digital fabrications that might be suitable, for example, for human habitation. So they might serve two purposes, one for the insect and one for the human inhabitant. So we've been working a lot with robotics and looking at the idea of robotics working over a very long period of time, slow robotics. People traditionally associate robots with automation and moving very fast. We're interested in the idea of them moving much more slowly um, to be able to, for example, care for nature over a long period of time. So to become artificial gardeners, for example, that um, both plant plants and nurture and look after them. And this is an experimental prototype that does that. We have two robots that we've programmed. Um, one of the robots inserts seeds into specific uh, locations on a 3D printed substrate and uh, the robot also feeds them water and nutrients and monitors them as they grow. Um, okay, I'm just going to show this video. So related to this work is also the idea of using uh, techniques from biological evolution to grow and um, design 3D prints. So in this video, we've just got a simple example. We have a computational system that is using evolution to try and find an unusual form that will still 3D print. So what you're seeing on the screen is the algorithm actually altering the parameters of the development of this form to find the optimum form that will print successfully on a 3D printer. And in a minute, you'll see the results of that. So that's the final form after it's been evolved. It's still just in uh, digital form as computation. So then we go and 3D print that form. Um, so I'll show you some examples of that. So the, the problem with 3D printing, of course, is that it's turning something that's digital and virtual into something that is physical and material. And this materialization process is something that's really core to this work. So how do you go from a digital representation, which is in a sense perfect and isn't subject to the laws of physics or nature or anything like that, into something that is representable physically and it can be materialized. Um, and the latest work we've been doing on this is a series of algorithms called quality diversity. These basically search for not only the fittest individual. So in Darwinian evolution, you always think of survival of the fittest as being the single best individual. Whereas in these systems, we're actually um, rewarding diversity. So we try and find the most diverse set of forms and then evolve each um, of those diverse forms to be the most suitable for printing. So what you see in, in this um, slide is the diversity of forms that the system has been able to find, but they're also all, or well, most of them are all printable as well. So it's managed to basically find two things. One is diversity in a system. So how can we find all the really interesting parts of the system, but also to make that diversity work in terms of its fitness. So to evolve the fitness for each of the diverse elements um, that the system has been able to find. So in traditional evolution, you're just optimizing fitness. In this system, you're optimizing fitness and diversity simultaneously. And these are some of the results um, that, we've, that we've 3D printed. Um, we also worked very closely with another artist, Andy Lomas, who's very well known for his morphogenic form. So he develops software that simulates biological development. Um, so we combined that with um, uh, machine learning techniques and so neural networks, basically looking at the objects the same way that the artist is looking at it and learning about the artist's preferences. So we managed to train a neural network to basically 
um, understand what it is that the artist himself is finding interesting about the work and then for the machine to go away and look at a whole lot of examples and reject the ones that the artist wouldn't rate highly um, but to to actually save a lot of time in terms of the literally thousands of examples that in the system the artist has to look at before they find the form that they really like um, and, and this is just a very abstract diagram but it shows how the computer was able to classify the um, different categories that an individual human artist had actually done in a way that makes sense to them. Um, Nina will talk about her work, but this is another example of the creative AI work that we, we do in the lab. Um, and um, as you've already seen her work that Daria demonstrated and she'll have a lot more to say about that in a moment. Um, another project that we're really excited about is um, uh, non-anthropocentric creativity. So what does art look like when it's made by things that aren't human? And, you know, there's a way to think about this already in that in nature there is um, there are organisms that uh, use the creation of aesthetics, for example, as a way to attract mates. So the, in Australia, there's a bird called a bowbird. It's not just in Australia, it's also in parts of Southeast Asia. And this bird builds very intricate and detailed nests that often use a particular colour or a particular structure. And they, when you look at them, they feel like they're, they have some artistic quality, but it's not the same kind of considerations that human artists would have. We're really interested in the idea of what kind of art would machines make as well. So in order to facilitate this, we've been building a series of robots that draw. And um, I was very lucky to be involved in a previous exhibition that Daria organized in Moscow, uh, 2018, where we presented um, a version of this work. We've been working on it since then. We have um, a newer version um, at the moment, um, which is looking really great. And we're aiming to make this available to people all over the world as a kit to use. And um, as a basically a way to philosophically explore this idea of machines being creative and what does it mean for a machine to be an artist or to create art. And I guess lastly, you know, at the sort of frontier of some of the work we're doing is looking at the idea of understanding how people respond to this before they're even consciously aware of that. So using machine learning in combination with um, uh, 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 understanding the, the way that the brain is, is signaling pre in pre-conscious form to anticipate how a machine might interface with a person. So that's just a very brief kind of whirlwind summary of some of the research that we do. And hopefully it's given you a little bit of a taste for the kinds of projects that we're involved in. As you can see, they're very diverse, uh, but they're all sort of underpinned by the creative use of technology, not necessarily just for artistic purposes, but for, um, for scientific research, for medical research. And I think it's that really interesting mix of different disciplines, scientific disciplines, creative disciplines together that allows us to really explore the potential of technology in a way that's both useful and creatively interesting. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there and hand back to Daria. Thank you. Daria. Uh, apparently they, they're they were listening to the youtube channel and everything was happening there with lag i'm i'm hearing my interpretation coming back that would be great to dive uh, deeper 
honestly, and uh, I think uh, many of our uh, listeners, our audience, they have questions already. Uh, I have several, uh, but I think we will wait till the end of the talk and then we collect all questions, right? And uh, I'm happy uh, to give a, a word now, to pass a word to Nina. Uh, Nina Rajic is uh, an artist and also a participant of our show. Uh, Please, Nina, tell us more uh, how you came to this idea of mirror ritual and uh, what, what emotions machines have for us. Uh, <laughs> and also, what was the process? Uh, it's, it's so interesting how long you developed this project and uh, what's next. Yeah, of course, of course. Okay, so I have a bunch of stuff about that. So that's perfect. Um, I'll just share my screen. Okay. All right, is that good? Yes, super. Cool, okay. So just wanna say thanks John for that. That was really cool to see, uh, I guess all of the Sensi Lab progress in the past couple of years. Um, so my name is Nina um, and I uh, I'm a PhD student at Sensi Lab, and I work very closely with John. Um, and I also just want to say thank you to Laboratoria for exhibiting my work. It's been um, a really wonderful experience working with everyone. Even though I couldn't actually go to Moscow, I still had a great time. And um, hopefully one day in the future, I'll be able to and to meet everyone. Um, and also thanks to everyone for tuning in today. Um, so. John talked a little bit about Sensi Lab and the kind of work that we do. Um, I'm going to talk more about uh, my work, Mirror Ritual specifically, and how it fits into my research and practice more broadly. Um, so, so, yes, I'm in the final year of my PhD at Sensi Lab, and the title of my thesis is about to, that's all, almost being written, is Post Human Rituals, which is also my Instagram handle. Um, and so my research revolves around basically the core idea of human machine relationships. And so by that, I mean, um, viewing relationships that we have with technology, just as other relationships in our lives as integral to who we are. So in the field of, um, human computer interaction, what's traditionally uh, involved is the design of interfaces that sit between humans and machines. Yet as technology becomes further and further entangled into daily life, the paradigms of machine interface user begin to break down. And so when we think about technologies like smartphones, social media, virtual reality, brain computer interfaces, bio implants, it brings us to the question, who exactly is the user? Um, that term implies that there are also periods of non-use and also that agency is exerted only in one direction by the user, the subject onto the tool, the object. And also where exactly lies the interface? So this question becomes more and more difficult to answer as we move from screen-based computing to embedded and embodied computing. So as a response to this, um, many have started to adopt a post-human framework to try and understand our relation to not only technology, but to everything that is non-human. And it's very much an, an umbrella term for a lot of diverse, um, but complementary approaches. But the basic idea is that the relationships that we have with things are more fundamental ontologically than us or the things themselves. It encompasses the decentering of the human and the relinquishing of dualistic categories like uh, subject, object, nature, culture, mind, body. Um, and the recent adoption of post-humanism definitely came about because of um, technology and AI, as well as other issues like climate change. But really, it is an approach that kind of just applies to everything. So it doesn't really concern the distant future or the near future. It's really about today. Um, and when applying 
this kind of approach to human computer interaction, it brings us to the conclusion or brings me to the conclusion anyway, that in designing interfaces, really what we're designing are the relationships between human humans and technology, where these relationships, they not only influence our perceptions, beliefs, and realities, um, they actually define us as well. So a perfect example of this kind of relationship uh, with a non-human agent that uh, is one we all have is the relationship we have with our phones. So more specifically, um, the relationship we have with the AI system that curates in real time the stream of content that we're each exposed to, so also known as the newsfeed. So the AI on the other end of your phone definitely has agency, and its goal really is simple. It's to maximize screen time, add revenue, profits. And the system is also distinctly inhuman. It doesn't care about humanist ideals like sovereignty, freedom, or liberty. It doesn't even care if you're a human at all. And the favored behavior of these algorithms and so the, the generated behavior in humans is one of unreflective and reactionary engagement. So this relationship is then by design habitual. Now habits loosely can be defined as automatic and repetitive behaviors that require uh, little conscious effort or intention. But rituals on the other hand involve similar behaviors yet are in contrast, um, are done on purpose and with full awareness. So in my work, what I'm trying to do is to design relationships between humans and machines that are meaningful, intentional, challenging, unexpected, that explore new possibilities. And the idea isn't to kind of replicate existing human rituals with technology, but it's actually to produce shared meaning in the human, non-human assemblages that we see today. So the first work I created as a part of this research is Mirror Ritual. And I'll quickly just describe it and summarize for anybody who doesn't know. So basically the work looks and functions like a regular mirror. However, when a person approaches, their emotional state is perceived and they are presented a machine generated poem in response. Um, and the idea is that the viewer makes sense of the poetry by framing it with respect to their current emotional state which kind of allows them to put their feelings into words and ultimately to begin to weave a narrative around their recent experiences. And the mirror embodies both a critique of emotion classification technologies, while at the same time, it offers kind of a positive and constructive alternative. But obviously, when I first started this project, I didn't have any of that theory figured out. Um, it was definitely more of an intuitive process. Uh, and I just followed what I felt made sense to me. And so what um, happened was that I, I kind of followed the practice and then most of the theory came after. But originally, it was simply the idea that, um, I guess, whatever meaning people took from me or my writing really has nothing to do with me at all. And that no one really understands what I say, but that they very deeply understand what they hear. And I think there's something to that which I wanted to explore. And so I was very lucky and grateful to find Sensi Lab and John, um, who really allowed me to basically just do whatever I wanted with no restrictions or template or guideline. Um, and so my background was actually in physics. I did a bachelor's and then a master's in particle physics. So I wasn't really used to working in such an unconstrained way because uh, physics is all about constraints. <laughs> but um, pretty quickly, I kind of realized that there was only one thing that I wanted to make at that time. So where it started was that um, I kind of wanted to build this mirror for myself. Um, so that's where I began. I started with developing a system that I liked that I wanted to use for myself. And I was really interested in this idea of removing the human from the equation and still finding meaning. And so if there is still meaning, then where is it coming from? And obviously this led me to even more questions. Um, and I started to explore new language that could basically help me to understand all of these themes and ideas better. Things like uh, construction of emotion, narrative, meaning, identity, all came into play. 
And I also researched uh, into something called the theory of constructed emotion, which basically uh, proposes that emotions aren't these kind of fixed static categories that are hardwired in the brain, but instead that they're constructed from a number of more basic things like language, context, lived experience, and that they are constructed and exist also with just within an interaction. Um, and so I saw that I was using poetry as a way to expand upon the concepts available to, uh, to basically create an effective interface that allowed me to better understand how I was feeling. And so rather than being a prescriptive technology where the machine is seen as kind of objective impartial observer, the mirror simply offers suggestions and gives back some of that responsibility to the viewer. So once we had a physical prototype going, I noticed that my feelings towards the mirror definitely changed. It was now an embodied uh, thing and it had a physical presence. This is kind of videos from the first time we had it working, um, probably a couple, over a couple of years ago now. And also seeing the reaction from other people for the first time also surprised me a lot. I started to hear stories about the mirror, like completely independent from me and about their experiences and how they conceptualize the mirror, which was super interesting. And what I found that was people make sense of the poetry by framing it in the context of their own personal experiences and how they were feeling at that time. And also that the experience itself was made meaningful by the fact that they could contextualize the poetry. And also that sometimes it brought out dormant emotions, um, basically giving people the language to understand what they were feeling. But really what interested me the most is how, how people began to form relationships with the mirror. So they began to describe, as, ascribe it agency, um, in some cases intention, and they even started kind of developing emotions and feelings towards it, which I really wasn't expecting. Um, and so it made me think about the kind of relationship that I have designed. Um, when you think about it, it's kind of challenging, um, as I'm sure maybe some of you know. It definitely asks something of you, but at the same time, it's rewarding and it's meaningful. So basically, I wanted to explore this idea further. Um, and instead of focusing just on emotion and effective computing in particular, I wanted to extend to this idea of ritualized relationships with technology. So all of that kind of early experimentation formed the inspiration for my second work, which I'm currently developing called Message Ritual. So it's similar to Mirror Ritual in that it uses machine generated poetry to promote kind of reflection and introspection. However, instead of focusing only on emotion, Message Ritual explore, explores the ways in which this kind of technology can support memory. And so I started to think about memory um, and the way that it's treated in technology and in intelligent systems. So one of the common or traditional approaches uh, with augmented memory is just to capture everything and store it so that nothing is lost and that basically you have all the raw, da raw data and that you can kind of maybe use an AI system to kind of filter through that somehow. However, this kind of ideal of total capture doesn't necessarily align with the way that autobiographical memory actually works. So one of the primary functions of autobiographical memory is to allow one to form a coherent sense of self. And so personal memories work to shape one's identity and in turn this self-identity actually influences the way the past is remembered so it's a very iterative process um, so in this way autobiographical memory can kind of be likened to a narrative but a narrative that is continuously subject to revision And so Message Ritual draws inspiration from this kind of understanding of autobiographical memory. Um, rather than treating memory like a database of moments that can be sorted and retrieved, this work acknowledges that the past is malleable. 
So basically how it works is that the system listens in on conversations occurring within the home. And this is done kind of continuously throughout the day in like an ambient way. And then each night um, it creates a transcript using speech to text and then runs some natural language processing on the transcript to determine the key themes and topics of the, of the previous day. And then these um, kind of topics are used to generate a unique poem similar to the mirror, but it is delivered um, as a text message um, to each person that's like living in that house. And here's just come some mock-ups of uh, the development process. And so when, um, when I was designing this new project and considering the form it should take, I generalized from the choices made with mirror ritual. Um, so with the mirror, it's kind of supposed to look and function like a regular mirror in your home. And so the use of kind of an everyday domestic object was chosen not really to so, so much to improve the object's function, but basically to bypass any preconceived notions or behaviors that you may associate with uh, traditional interfaces like screens. And so applying this same thinking to message ritual, um, the listening device is basically embedded in a lamp which sits inside the home. And so on the left, you can see the first kind of prototype that I'm working with at the moment. Uh, but then of course, obviously the choice of using text message um, as the way to deliver the poem is kind of done for the opposite reason, which is that this kind of morning ritual uh, is intended to disrupt or to replace the common morning habit of checking calendars, reading emails, scrolling through the newsfeed when you first wake up. So I'm currently in the middle of testing um, the whole system. It's the lamp is live and it's sending messages at the moment. Um, so hopefully very soon I will discover more about the kind of relationships people form with it. So these works I've talked about uh, are all kind of conceptually linked and um, kind of turning them into a series. So each work embodies a critique on traditional approaches of quantifying the self, but they also all, all draw inspiration from the links between language and ultimately narrative in the construction and reconstruction of one's self-identity. And in addition to mirror ritual and message ritual, I'm also currently experimenting with this idea of engraving or inscribing uh, or weaving machine generated poetry into different materials. So machine generated poetry can, you know, traditionally be seen as lacking significance or meaning uh, in the sense that it is easy, you know, to generate thousands or millions of poems in, this, in a short period of time. So they kind of become cheap. So this work is kind of a response to the transient nature of machine poetry. So by taking excerpts from the poems and inscribing them into these physical materials like aluminium, steel, and various textiles, the narratives behind the poetry are given a greater sense of value and permanence. And I've also experimented with jewelry as a medium with these bracelets uh, that I made during kind of the first big lockdown uh, when I had heaps of time at home. Um, and this kind of experimentation basically just provided a lot of insight into how these constructed narratives can actually be embedded into physical and static artifacts. So um, each of these projects embody, I guess, a critique on traditional approaches of kind of quantif quantification of the self. So the measurement of emotion, the outsourcing of memory, but while at the same time, they are offering positive and optimistic alternatives for technology. So in response to, I guess, the increasingly common tendency to mold the human into a form that can be understood by a machine, the ritual series instead explores the ways in which uh, the human machine relationship can be reconfigured entirely. And so each project addresses a different aspect of what constitutes the self. So there's emotion, memory, and materiality, which I've become more interested in recently, and at various scales of temporality, so momentary, extended, and forever, and also in a variety of contexts, personal, domestic, and public. 
So my research and practice is basically a response uh, to the way in which these habitual and unconscious relationships with technology is being normalized today. Um, the works map out a speculative future of relationships um, that aren't based in habit, but rituals that are intentional and meaningful that don't attempt to quantify the self, but to foster the construction and reconstruction of the self through narrative. So these speculative and realized projects illustrate a future in which our relationships with technology can create new forms of meaning and experience that weren't possible before. And so that's all I have prepared for today, but I would love to take some questions later, but I'll bring it back to Daria. Thank you, Nina, uh, for your wonderful talk. Uh, yeah, we have questions. Uh, and I also invite all who are watching us now uh, in English channel or in Russian channel, please write in YouTube your questions and we will tell them aloud. I have actually questions. I want to start with the questions from our friend and colleague for many years, uh, Mikhail Burtsev. Uh, John, maybe you remember Misha. Of course, you remember Misha. Uh, yes. And he just wrote us a question for you and actually for Nina, but it's both for you. Uh, so Mikhail Burtsev is one of our, in Russia, one of, uh, let's say, famous uh, uh, scientist, uh, uh, he has his own project. Uh, he's a founder of I, um, I Pavlov, I Pavlov, which is an um, uh, artificial AI um, speaking, mamma mia, um, oral AI, artificial, yeah, oral AI, um, speaking AI. And he is um, sending this question. Is it possible that in future AI agents and humans will be part of the same symbiotic ecosystem? You want me to go first? Yeah. Um, yes, I, th I think so. Um, I, you know, there's a lot of speculation about the future of AI at the moment because it's become such a big commercial proposition. Uh, but I think we, we are still a long way from the goal of general AI, despite what a lot of the researchers and the, the media might, might suppose. And I think what people don't understand, or maybe they don't necessarily focus on, is the idea that technology is changing us. And so it's not so much that AI will come up to the task and meet us, it's more that we are changing to meet it. And I think you can see this in the way that people behave now in terms of their reliance on things like recommender systems or the news feeds, the things that Nina was talking about just a moment ago, um, that this symbiotic relationship, that this ecosystem between technology and people is really being formed not so much by people, but by technology and that we're adapting to it because we're a very adaptable species, right? We, 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 we're very plastic and flexible, both in, in neurological terms, but also in, in social terms as well. So I, I do think it's happening, but I think it's something we need to be concerned about, or at least we need to, we need, we need to be critical of it and we need to comment on it um, rather than just letting it sort of wash over us. Thank you, John. Nina, would you add something? Yeah, I mean, I guess my, yeah, my initial response is that I feel like it's already happening, like maybe not in the way that we would want it to be happening or in a way that's like super visible, but I, I definitely feel, you know, that that we're already kind of living in that world. And obviously we don't have, you know, really general intelligence, but you know, just I'm, I, just what I was saying before about um, the feed, I feel like that's kind of a system that has a lot of power and, and control over our behavior and it is really symbiotic. And yeah, I mean, and I'm sure there's other things, other great examples as well. So I don't think that future is too far away. Mm -hmm. And um, so the question when our yeah, listeners are still thinking what to write. Uh, and uh, so the question from my side, 
uh, for me as a curator, so I, I, I see that so many artists now start to use machine learning in their artworks. Actually, now uh, in this show, what uh, I just made a, a super short excursion, uh, it was so many works that in this or in that way used machine learning. But my question is, what do you think that is there any potential problems and threats of uh, so widespread of using a machine learning? I mean, of course, not in art, but in general. So this, that's, this weak AI is everywhere now. It looks like it's penetrating all spheres. And what do you think? Because art and uh, I think in Sensi Lab, you are also, uh, you know, criticizing and reflecting on some possible uh, other sides of this uh, technology. Yeah, I think definitely. Um, that's kind of where a lot of my stuff came from was by like, I think I started, I didn't go into full detail, but I started um, when I started my PhD, I was actually really interested in emotion detection in like a naive sense. <laughs> I really was like, oh, like what could a machine, I guess, like know about me that I don't know. And that was the, I guess that was the approach I first had. And then when I learned more about uh, the actual technology, I, and also the science itself and the fact that these two things, like it's quite, it's using quite old science that isn't really like valid anymore. But the fact that those that science still lives on in the technologies and algorithms that we're making, it really made me, um, yeah, a little bit kind of concerned because I, I don't really think it, it's not really reflecting. It's not really as impartial and objective as I think the majority of people would expect. Although now I think definitely people are kind of becoming more aware of that. Like it's more in the kind of general conversation, right? That there's bias in AI. Um, yeah, I don't know if John had anything more to add on that. Um, well, maybe, may I just say something about, because Daria's question was kind of about artists using it as well. And yes, certainly oh, yeah. there's, yeah, there's a lot of artists using AI at the moment. And, you know, what you do tend to see a little bit is that um, there's different approaches. So some approaches often just take the software that's available as for granted and start exploring what capabilities it has, has. And that, I think, tends to result in a kind of genericism in the work that's produced often. Whereas other artists are actually uh, thinking about either unpacking the whole idea of machines that learn and how they learn and what they learn and the, as Nina mentioned, the biases and so on, and um, working in a very different way. So, uh, I mean, in the earliest days of computer art, for example, people always had to write their own software because there was no software that people could, could use. Everyone had to write software for a computer. So you had to understand, firstly, how to write software and how a computer worked. And writing it is, is like being an author. So when you author something, you, you're the creator of that. Whereas now, hardly anybody writes software from scratch because there's so much software that is available as open source software that you can download from the internet. And a lot of that just sort of becomes just part of the, the way that you just, it, it's, it, it's invisible in a sense that you don't question where it came from, how it was written, what it does, and you just use it. So I think there is a, a growing difference. And as we increasingly rely on software written by other people, even as artists to do that, um, we're, we're kind of moving away from the whole idea of authorship in the traditional sense. And that's something that I, I don't necessarily think is a bad thing, but I think it's something that we really need to be thinking about. Uh, John, but what do you think if, not, if we are talking not about art, but uh, in general, so I mean that it's uh, machine learning is everywhere. And do you see that it's no really any problematic sides of, of this? No any oh. really threats of uh, machine learning everywhere? I mean, that was my example that in art already we have it, you know, everyone is, so many artists using it. 
and mm. uh, but in yeah, life. Yeah, I, I don't. I, I think it's it's like any piece of technology. You know, there are good uses, and there's certainly many benefits from using machine learning. Otherwise, people wouldn't be using it. It wouldn't have got the popularity it has. But there's also many dangers and many traps, and that's something that I think. You know, the discussion, the public discussion around the use of machine learning technologies is something that is very important because, as we said at the beginning, this is kind of directing how people behave. So your behaviour now is often determined by algorithms rather than by other people or by the social situation you find yourself in or the mm -hmm. cultural situation that you're in. Mm -hmm. And who is writing those algorithms? It's usually just a very select small group of people um, largely from the big tech companies. Uh, and so you have to question the sort of cultural authority that they have to do that. Um, and of course, we're willing participants too. So nobody's saying you have to ha have, you know, use these things, but try functioning in the world now without them. And it's incredibly difficult. So, yeah, I think it's like any, it's any, any technology, there's not a, a, a universal goodness or badness about it. It's what we do with it and how we use it that counts. Mm -hmm. um, I was thinking that it's important that one of the main question, who is taking a decision when machine learning making a decision that we mm. want to be sure that this is a right decision, right? If, even if it's, uh, you know, uh, a doctor, we will come in near future to the doctor who will uh, make us a recipe or it's a lot of, I don't know how it's in Sydney or in Melbourne, but here in Moscow, we have already uh, autonomous uh, driving cars. They are still in test regime. Do you have the same? Mm. Yeah. Uh, the in testing, yeah, they're not, yeah, they they're not everywhere, but yeah, yeah, we, testing, we, yeah. yeah, they are testing, but it's so many of them <laughs> that sometimes I feel like, oh, what's going next? So they will be without, uh, you know, a testing uh, driver sitting to, to check. And mm. I think that the projects in Sensi Lab and also Nina's projects, so they maybe draw attention to what uh, to these borders what machine can uh, what what decisions machine can make and this emotional ai what what you are studying in many of your projects so this uh, giving us some more ideas how far uh, how many rights we can give to machines if if i understand right so I wanted to know maybe some 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 something something more in this direction, and also one more question uh, going here as well. Uh, so Nina, is someone from industry? I interested in mirror ritual. Uh, is someone really want to use it for some special tricks? I don't know in maybe shopping centers. Uh, that people are <laughs> trying it, uh, some some new outfit, and it says, "Oh, you're looking so nice, <laughs> or not nice." I don't know, but just we were a little bit fantasizing here, or how, how what's next? Because really, your your projects they are a little bit, I mean, not a little bit. They are one step further. They are already in future. Mm -hmm. A little bit, uh, you know, far that we are now in the moment and we can look into this future. Um, so that's some of my thoughts and some questions, because I'm, I'm sure that in Sensi Lab you are talking about this all, uh, you know, uh, uh, advantages and disadvantages of technology, what's bringing us and some threats, how it is there. <laughs> on your side <laughs> well I'll answer the second question first I'm, I haven't really had any um, interest from the kind of corporate or kind of industry aspects I don't know how much I mean I don't know how much um, it is I mean I think maybe if people misunderstand what I'm trying to do then maybe they could you know uh see some kind of value in it but really i don't see i don't really see it being profitable uh i really see the, the kind of the point of making it was actually for the user right when a lot of technologies actually are not made for the user they're made for the company to 
for whatever reason. So if you think of like home speakers or all of the apps, you know, they're not made for us to use them, right? Because we're not paying for them. They're just made for other kind of uh, reasons that we don't really know what they are, right? But I, I just wanted to make something that's actually, you know, you can own and actually benefit from in your everyday. Like, I just want technology like that to exist when I feel like so much of technology is overrun by this kind of like, uh, yeah, just this, this is kind of just my general feeling about, it's not, I don't want to be too de- depressing, but it's just my general feeling about my technology use today. Like, I'm not really happy with it. That's kind of where everything came from. Anyway, I think I left the question, <laughs> but it kind of comes back to your other question about, um, sorry, re- remind me, what was this? What was the first question? So the first question is, uh, okay, I'm, I'm not insisting in it, but it's, it's interesting for me, the critical side of uh, uh, AI, I mean, machine learning when we say AI, and I'm interested in uh, uh, how the, the project, the art projects, uh, which involve uh, emotional studies on emotional AI, possibilities of AI to, to understand emotions and to become more emotional, uh, uh, so where it brings us, does it give more rights to machines or, uh, I mean, so can, can we really think a little bit uh, like we are in 10 years in future now? Um, I mean, uh, so my kind of, yeah, like my appraisal of the whole emotional AI thing is basically that it comes down to we don't really understand human emotions uh, for ourselves like there isn't any science i guess there is kind of these frameworks and theories now that are really great and i do kind of um subscribe to them but in terms of measurement it really is at a point where i don't see personally that any of it is meaningful um which is you know like that's kind of what i wanted to to do is to make something that actually um measures right it measures emotion but i think it's just a, it's just a different kind of interaction that we need to be thinking about and i don't know if those uses like if you're thinking more industry or shopping centers or whatever i don't think that they would be thinking about using it in that way it would be much more like we are the kind of objects of this machine learning program and we're kind of just passed through this algorithm and then we just listen to like we just listen to the output Mm-hmm. Yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, so next question or, uh, yeah. Um, so yeah, actually 30 people for 30, yeah. Uh, we have 30 listeners for uh, during all the talk. They are listening to us carefully and uh, attentively, but no questions. I'm wondering, so please, if you are listening to us, it's, it's for sure, it's, yeah, it's interesting for you. Yeah, in English channel, not so many, but in Russian 30, uh, please write us uh, your questions to John, Nina, or to Laboratory Art and Science here to Moscow. Um, and uh, I have more questions then. Um, I would like to ask um, John about uh, if you can please tell us. So I have several questions. I have in this initial form project. I would love if you if you if you can tell a little bit more uh, on once st- what stage is it now and in connection to this project. Maybe you can tell us. Uh, what is a usual cycle of a production of a new project. So how long it, it is uh, for development of the idea, how it's going, so how is this multidisciplinary port of uh, professionals, uh, uh, how much time for idea, for, um, for prototyping and for the production. So it's very interesting for us uh, here in uh, Art Science Lab in Moscow because we also have an incubator, as you remember, 
it is mm. was not so active last uh, year uh, because we were mostly all our uh, power was uh, given to to open a new space physical space i mean mm. and all this mm. renovation and you know different type of <laughs> of work uh, but we again uh, starting restarting uh, with a new power um, yeah, yeah, thank you. Mm. Questions are coming. Uh, uh, we are restarting now incubator program, so means with the production also. And um, also I'm reviewing our methodology uh, and would be great to hear what's some glimpse in, in what's going yeah. on on your side. Yeah, so I mean, the question about the, the timing for the projects, it really depends on a whole lot of different things. So some, some projects uh, come together very quickly and someone has an idea, we have the ability to sort of turn that idea into reality very quickly. But many of the projects are very iterative. So one idea becomes something different after a period of time. And uh, as I mentioned in the presentation, uh, there's a number of projects that we're working on that feed into each other. So a piece of technology developed for one project actually becomes useful for something else. So the air sticks that I showed, the musical instrument that works just by moving the drumstick in the air, the, um, the, the technology that's used for that came from two other projects that were completely unrelated. So part of the way that we like to work is that we, we do a lot of sharing of the work that we do. And that gives, it's, it's kind of cross-pollination. So it gives people ideas that they might not have thought of before. So, um, yeah, I, but I think the general rule is that it always takes a lot longer than you think. And uh, to go from something that's 80% working to 100% takes the same amount of time to get that last 20% as it did to give you the first 80%. So... We, we do have a lot of projects and many of them are kind of not ready to be talked about or uh, are just kind of not quite there yet. Um, and it, it might be that they'll be ready in a few weeks. It might be that they'll take several more months. So, yeah, it's, it's very hard working with technology to, to work to deadlines. And also we are just, you know, we're a fairly small group of people. We're not like a big company that has... 50 or 100 people working, there's really about 12 or 15 people working in the lab generally. So we're not a huge group of people and everyone has, is working on their own projects. So um, yeah, it's, it's slow, but, but fun. Thank you. Um, so we have a question, but it's one of the you know, usual questions, how this all uh, financed? <laughs> so the artist is asking <laughs> that uh, if, if you do this kind of project, uh, how you finance it? Is it a sponsor or uh, fund some grant? So it varies. Um, we were very lucky that in setting up the lab, um, it was funded by our university. So the facilities that we have were largely paid for by the university. Uh, for individual projects, it really depends. So something like Nina's project uh, was, was really just funded internally. And it's, uh, I guess, the great benefit of working in a lab like we have, a, a lot of the, the monetary costs are largely in people. They're not in the technology. This, the technology that's used is... Um, I mean, it costs money, but that's not the big cost. The big cost is people. And we're very lucky that we have great people who we can draw upon in a, in a university environment um, to, to help with what we do. Some projects we do get commercial funding from. So uh, these are often more practically oriented, but we also work with cultural organisations. So we have, you know, in the past, we've worked with Australian cultural organisations who fund artistic production. Um, and the situation in Australia is generally quite reasonable. Uh, we have a government body that funds creative projects, the Australian Council. And while it doesn't give out a lot of money and it's very competitive, at least, you know, there is some money there. There is also a large number of festivals um, that, that happen that you can usually get some money from. So it's, I mean, it's not, 
it's it's not like it's great, but I also would say that um, many of these projects that I've talked about, they're not hugely expensive to produce. They're, they're you know, they're, um, they're, they're achievable within the budgets that we have, which are not huge. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, also, our listeners, uh, yeah, writing, thank you. And super interesting, the whole talk. And uh, so Maria uh, writes now, thank you for interesting conversation and great projects. My question to both speakers, what is the criterion for a successful project for you? Uh, or, is, uh, or is the development process itself and the study of uh, an, an environment more important for you? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. So I think one of the one of the parts of our philosophy is that we we do value the process as much as the outcome. Um, so in terms of defining success, I mean obviously, I mean I'll, I'll let Nina talk about her project too. But something like that, obviously, I think is is successful on a number of levels. It's successful on a creative level, um, but it's also it's also offering something. Um, it's offering an alternative to to the future that we're we're all going to be living in. And that's a positive um, offering. It's not the same as you get from uh, the big tech companies or from industry. It's an individual expression of what technology could be. And I think that's part of our ethos is that we don't just critique or criticize technology, that we try and find alternatives that are actually um, you know, interesting, at least, I, I hesitate to say that they're good or that they're for the betterment of people because that's a very complex thing to argue. But I think at least to say that they pose an alternative that is uh, positive and forward-looking is, is a really, is a good way of thinking about how we work. Um, and just, I mean, working in any artistic creative project raises questions. It asks people to consider things differently than the way that perhaps other disciplines do. So yeah, it's those those okay. outcomes are important, but also the process by which we do it, I think, is important. So we do reflect on how we build things and how we can do that better and how we can share the knowledge that we have more. Mm -hmm. But yeah, Nina, maybe you should say something. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I guess for success for me is I am um, like I said, that's how, the way I judge it is just by people's reactions. So the fact I didn't really know what you know, what it was going to become. And I didn't, like, I didn't have any, I didn't really, I don't have any basis to think that this could even happen. <laughs> so I was like, for me, just knowing that something that I kind of did that was very kind of like internal and for myself actually then extended to other people and that like, I can actually do that was successful to me. Um, yeah, I'm not really sure. I mean, I'm really sure that's, that's, that's how I define success, I think. Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's, it's kind of not having an agenda as well is really positive, mm. is to say that we're not actually mm. setting out to, to, with, with a particular opinion about something necessarily. We're exploring that possibility uh, for our own interest and hopefully that interest is interesting to other people, as Nina says. So rather than having a very fixed agenda where we're, we're trying to make something that is for people's good. You know, we're just experimenting with things and not all of them will be, but I, I think that's a much better approach than, you know, kind of having this thing that it has to be, it has to be for people's good or it has to be serving a purpose or it has to solve a problem um, mm. because that leads yeah. to very constrained thinking. Yeah. And definitely also that I guess, yeah, talking about the process, like the fact that I was able to make the mirror and then, you know, have people see it actually, you know, changed so much about my perception of the world and the theory that I kind of take on. So that that's also a success for me is that now I can take these ideas further and understand them better and that, you know, I've just kind of begun and I can continue to do this. Like that's, that's probably the most valuable thing. Yeah. Um, I also enjoy so much a process yeah, when, when I work and it's, uh, yeah, it's a very interesting question. What is a success? I think 
because uh, we are <laughs> we live in a, some I think different dimension. Sometimes when I go to our partners uh, and they ask, so uh, what is uh, what's happening? Can you tell us what is? So we need to tell about this success and what is the parameters of a success. It's it's uh, yeah. Uh, it it can be formal and it can be. Uh, totally different, you know. It's 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 uh, a separate, I think, talk on it uh, on what is this success in art world and in in our projects also. But I think definitely uh, the process is also very important, right? So when mm. when you do it, and I think also documenting a process, I see more and more in the exhibitions and the very good uh, exhibitions, which I admire. Uh, 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 it's so many uh, documentations of not only results which are presented. So look, this is an artwork, but uh, I noticed that a lot of process is shown now more. So let's say not only a mirror ritual, but then we would show, you know, how you came to it, uh, how you worked with the uh, 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 neural network and how you were choosing this or that uh, direction. Also, I wanted to mention also that we wanted so much to have a Russian version of mirror ritual. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, of course, John, and you know it, but for our listeners, I wanted also to mention this, that, uh, of course, uh, we did a lot of attempts, and we were talking with several labs for a long time, prepared already, uh, my colleagues from the team, they selected 2,000 uh, poems from uh, different periods, or, or Russian poems, uh, from from uh, three last centuries. And we were ready to give this to deep learning researchers to, to, you know, to feed neural network with this material uh, to, to receive a Russian version of mirror ritual. But uh, so pity that they were uh, so busy. Yeah. And we could not do this in time. Uh, but yeah, we, we, we do usually uh, also our versions and productions. Huh, now we, yeah, time is running and I think our listeners, they have uh, now, they, they had a feeling of a discussion and more questions are coming. Whew. So maybe let's do this. I will read you questions and you pick up and answer to what you want. What do you think? Because That's good. It's many, and I don't know really, and they mostly in Russian. Okay, so um, um, so this is a question that uh, all what you do is on intersection between art and uh, technology and science, and you are on this border. And what do you think? What's uh, what's more in it? uh science or art and please give what do you think what will tell us what do you think art for you what is art for you this is a question number one should i go on or you you, you tell us you you tell us something? no that's that's a that's a good, that's question. A good question yeah you go first nina no you go john <laughs> <laughs> what is art um well you? that's a, that is a very difficult question to answer but um I mean, I guess for us, it's, it's, you know, we're not, not everyone who works in our lab is an artist. And, but I think everyone who works in our lab knows what an artist is. And that's really important because uh, having that kind of communication and that understanding is, I think, what really makes us more unique, perhaps, than um, maybe our places where it's just people working in a single discipline. So, you know, in the past, to work with technology, you obviously have to work with technologists and engineers and so on. Um, and I think one of the things we've really invested in is even the people who, who came to our lab who weren't really artistically um, motivated at least understand a lot of the importance about re respecting other disciplines as much as, as artists, people respect the technology disciplines when they're working together. So, yeah, I think certainly having that, that dialogue where you can actually understand each other's language 
is the first step in a meaningful collaboration. And often people overlook that one person might say something and the other person interprets it in their understanding of that word. And that word might mean something very different depending on your background or your discipline. Um, so, yeah, I think that's one of the benefits of our lab is that we have this ongoing dialogue and, and there is a respect for different disciplines in terms of the knowledge that they bring and the way that they, they understand the world. Yeah, I guess and for me, like, yeah, well, I guess for me, like, even kind of before finding Sensi Lab, I always, like, I kind of held both art and technology, uh, art and science, not so much technology, art and science really as kind of both, like, in my head at the same time, like, I can relate, do you know what I mean? I just don't, I don't, for me, it's not, we, it's, it's strange that they are actually separated because um, I guess like I look, I still love science. Like I feel like, um, and that's actually what drives a lot of what I want to do. It's like, I want to actually understand like, what do we know about the human brain at this point? What really is emotion? Like I, I like have this kind of desire to like understand all these things from a scientific perspective. But the reason that I choose art, um, I guess where I have chosen art more so recently is that I feel like art kind of, when you get to like that boundary of science, then that's kind of where art continues. Like that, I, mean, I feel like I'm at that stage now because like I did physics because I wanted to understand, you know, how everything worked. Like when I initially decided to do it, I just wanted to understand how everything works. But you, then you realize pretty quickly that no discipline or like in science has any real answer, right? And you know, you get down to like fundamental particle physics you'd hope that maybe you could understand. And it's an, and I, like, I still love it, it's amazing, but there is like this limit. And so I feel like for me, art and poetry actually takes me beyond that limit. And that's kind of why I do it. Thank you. So many questions. I'm uh, afraid that we don't have time on it all. Uh, so uh, let's try. If, uh, if, uh, an, an art project is creating using AI technology and bioagents. Uh, how do you reveal the aspect of authorship, human authorship, multi-agent co-authorship, co -authorship, or machine authorship? Yeah, this is a question. Yeah, so yeah, this is a very this is a very good question, but it's also a very hard question to answer succinctly. Um, so yeah, we've, we've thought a lot about this and we've written papers about it and things as well. But uh, I, think the, I think what you, you kind of have to accept is that increasingly uh, non-human agency is becoming an author, not necessarily in the sense that we understand the human author, but that um, even things like physical material play an authorship role. So the whole idea of a sort of human superiority that the human is the instigator and author of everything is, is diminished so much these days. It's diminished by the fact that any technology that you're using, be it you know, neural networks or any artificial intelligence, is not just something that, as I mentioned earlier, you've done from scratch. You're relying on other people to develop that technology for you. You're relying on other people to make the computers that run it. But then you're also relying on other agents in um, the process as well. They could be biological agents. They could be um, artificial intelligence agents. So I think, yes, the, the concept of authorship is really being challenged. And there's this whole dialogue about death of the author and so on. And I think that's kind of timely in terms of um, what current technologies are doing. So like Nina's poetry, for instance, who's the author of that poetry? So Partially that comes from the original poems that the neural network was trained on, but also partially it's the, the selection of those poems by the artists that does it. It's also partially by the neural network that's generating those poems. So there's no one single author of that, of that poem, even though it's generated by a machine. The concept of authorship is, is really fundamentally changed, which is what makes this work so interesting and so challenging. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> Thank you. So one more question, maybe. Uh, there are many, but yeah, uh, we still have some small limit of time. Yeah. So it's a question about inclusion. So uh, do you involve a specialist? So it's in Russian, sorry. I'm, uh, 
translating it to how I understand the question. It's a long question. So uh, do you involve or do you invite people with disabilities to your projects uh, to participate, to, to build, um, you know, uh, inclusive uh, projects? Uh, and we'll jump yes. to it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Do you want me to answer? Yeah. 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 So yes, we do. We we have a whole group of people who work with people with all kinds of disabilities. So um, within our lab, there's a group that works with people with vision impairment. So um, trying to create new um, interfaces or, or ways of interacting with the world that don't rely on on vision. Um, and so also Alon, who who does the air sticks, works a lot with people with disability. Um, with limited motor ability, so um, uh, people with cerebral palsy or with uh, motor neuron disease, and actually, you know, music and physical physical music making is fantastic for those people. Even though they have very limited mobility, the joy and empowerment that they get from being able to actually create a musical composition um, is is incredible. So yeah, that's certainly. So and we have a whole range of projects that work with people with. Um, different abilities. Thank you. So the last, the, uh, uh, it is a very long, it is not the questions, it's the poems, I think. Transmitting party to present. Uh, yeah, I think it's more statements. It's not the questions. It's about empathy and empathy and the machine. And um, yeah, I, I, I think, uh, yeah, we are fine. And it's a lot of thanks, thanks in the Russian uh, channel. Uh, thanks to you. People say that it's a super interesting talk. And it's nice to have a feedback. Yeah, thank you to people who listen to us and to write. It's really important to feel that we are talking. It's, it's for me also very important and interesting to talk always with John and Nina. But it's nice to hear your yeah your your uh, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. People say uh, your reactions, and I would like uh, to summarize uh, and uh, to thank you both again. It would be fantastic to have you physically in Moscow. That last time uh, John came for in 2018 for Diamonds in the Machine. Uh, and we had a fantastic reception in Australian Embassy in Moscow. And you gave a talk. It was so great. And a special atmosphere. And also I wanted to thank also again Australian Embassy who supported Nina's project. And uh, it's very important that also in this even uh, stranger and, and it's, it's difficult times of pandemic when it's not, it's difficult to travel and also shipping is different. So they helped us to bring a mirror ritual to Moscow and it's brilli brilliantly working, properly working here. And uh, also, I want to thank uh, our strategic partner, uh, Kaspersky Lab, uh, with uh, uh, help of who we, we opened a new space, actually, and we can show new projects. And we are looking forward to collaborate, John, with the Sensor Lab further. So next show is in November, new elements. Um, um, and also I want to thank today uh, two people who helped us so much to help to, to, uh, to hold this, uh, uh, this lecture, this conversation. Uh, so it's uh, our interpreter with who we worked for many times already. It's uh, Dmitri, thank you so much. I know that the interpret interpreting and all the translation today was fantastic. Uh, as usual, because you are high professional and it's so great that you are together to, together with us today. Dimitri, thanks a lot to you. And also to Max, uh, who is our tax specialist today, who held this. Uh, so for, usually we, we have uh, offline conferences 
and it's a little bit new for us. I, I participated many times in online conferences, but not as an organizer. So with the uh, Max and Lauren Ibsen, I hope with, that we will be on high level on online uh, uh, lectures and conferences now. Thanks you guys uh, that you helped us, uh, to the team, to all. And um, yeah, we, we want to have you in Moscow soon again and to collaborate with you and to bring you yeah. to Moscow. Well, thank you, Daria, for the opportunity. And we'd love to, to come back when we can. So thank you so much for, even, even though it's virtual, um, hopefully next time we'll be able to see each other in, in real space rather than virtual space. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much for your inspirations, for all your experience that you shared. It's really precious for us here. And to feel that, you know, it's the uh, same thinking is happening in the world and same vision. So it's very important for us also. Thank you, Nina, for your Definitely. work. Thank you so much, Daria. And yeah. thanks for selecting it as well. I'm, I'm very honored. Thank you. Thank you for all our listeners. Please follow up on our <laughs> social networks and you know more news about next online talks. Thank you to all. Goodbye. Thanks. Ciao.